Kelly Byers is presenting today. She's a sociology major at UDU with an emphasis in diversity and minors in strategic communications and business management. Um, she'll be explaining anthropological history of love and marriage and will discuss sociological research on the topic of ethical non-monogamy and the social constructionism of romantic love as well as share the arguments and criticisms of polyamorous communities. So, let's hear it for Kelly. That's a mouthful, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So, I'm Kelly, and um, like Jeff said, I'm a sociology major at EDU, and um, I've been doing my undergraduate research in um, the philosophical um, ethics with uh, non monogamy. So, that's uh, kind of what I've been doing for the last like couple semesters. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, so I've been writing my dissertation research, uh, my capstone research on this um, this semester. Um, so just as an introduction, um, the nature of love has been a mainstay in philosophy since ancient Greece. Um, modern romantic love has often been defined as um, being, uh, according to Aristotelian theory, it's defined as being uh, two bodies and one soul. Um, that's an Aristotle quote. Monogamous romantic love is frequently regarded as being of the highest status um, ethically than what some consider inferior forms of affection. Anything less than exclusive, closed romantic relationships are often treated with disdain and disparagement in most Western cultures. Um, so, in order to discuss this predicament, uh, we have to like kind of talk about what love is and define it um, before we can like discuss the complexities um, and the nature of the history of love. So there's a lot of like uh, social pressures and um, the societal expectations surrounding romantic love. And so I'm just going to briefly go over the anthropological history of it. So um, the first uh, domestic institution in human history was not the family, but matrilineal clans. Um, and uh, they, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, the clans were formed together based off of um, individual families and they were basically based on property rather than like romanticism or anything like that so um the the rise of property disempowered women by triggering a switch to patrilineal instead of matrilineal clans so it used to be based on like um who carried the baby and um like followed the line of the mothers and then when property came into existence that changed so this was mostly to ensure uh, female fidelity and so that there was like no um, questions about the legitimacy of child uh, paternity and also like made sure that power stayed within certain familial structures. And this eventually led to the norm of monogamous marriages and monogamous family units that uh, we see in Western culture starting around the 15 and 1600s. And this is, um, what kind of led to women being viewed as, as property um, and marriage being like a form of branding. So that's like the feminist critique for um, monogamous marriage is that like it is kind of like traditionally a sexist institution the way that, that it was first started in Western cultures. Um, so a relationship based on property rights like what I've defined um, historically would be considered a non-consensual monogamous relationship since it's, uh, it doesn't have like any quality between the two individuals involved. And um, so for the purposes of discussing non-monogamy, um, I'm defining like consent uh, within monogamy as only being moral when it's completely voluntary and it's like a sex and love relationship. Um, so despite, um, despite a westernized society that encourages and enforces monogamy as the single best and only accepted form of romantic love. Um, looking deeper into the metaphysics of love suggests that the practice of consensual non-monogamy um, can be both reasonable and practical um, in addition to monogamy in society. Um, there's also like a concerning lack of ethics, however, that I'm gonna discuss a little bit today in many polyamorous communities, um, as well as an absence of efforts to include intersectional visibility and give equal representation. Um, yeah. um, 
to marginalized peoples. So, um, so this is just a map that shows, like, as of 1980, what like the world uh, practice of monogamy and non-monogamy looks like. Um, over 80% of the globe today practices some form of non-monogamy. Um, you can see that, like, looking at the picture here. Um, so most most countries perform non-monogamy or polygamy, um, and the Western culture is one of the few that is uh, primarily monogamous. So. Um, we can see that this uh, it's not practiced most likely because of advanced and established societies. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is most likely because um, advanced and established societies don't have a need for polygamy or um, polyamory in order to survive and allocate resources properly. Um, that's like that's primarily why other cultures do that because it's easier for societies if like multiple women are with one man, so then it's not like spread out as much, um, like property and other like uh, other property words like that. Um, so because of this, it's a fair assumption to say that monogamy is a luxury and it's granted to those of us that are in privileged areas in um, in the world. Um, this can lead to assumptions. That monogamy is also better than polyamory, um, since the common practice in first world countries is monogamy. So it's the. Yes? I'm sorry. Are you open to questions? Yes, I was going to take them at the end, if that's okay. I just don't understand why polygamy is needed in some places, but you said it's not needed in like more wealthy areas. Can yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? Like, um, yeah, so when um, in societies where there's like less resources, um, every time that like if you are having like a one-on-one -on -one partner relationship, then like each resources are spread out more. Um, so like for example, there are actually a few examples of polygynous tribes in certain areas of the world where um, it's common for all, all the brothers in a family to marry one woman because that way like all of their um, the property that they would be given by their parents doesn't get split up and then it becomes less. So instead, they marry the same woman so the property all stays together in the same family and it's better for allocation purposes. Um, and also like just, you know, as I mentioned briefly, like the history of uh, polyamory, um, it made more sense um, like around the time, like during hunter-gatherer times in, in history because um, it meant that there was a better survival chance for the species. Um, more women could be impregnated at one time, and um, it meant that it was like kept together. Like there was more f uh, familiarity between women because um, they were all like together more often. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so uh, monogamy came about when, it, like, as a as a luxury in society because of romanticism in marriages. Um, love didn't used to be, like it wasn't really a primary part of marriage, it was like a social contract between two people, usually to do with politics and um, for status in societies. And so later on, um, mostly in like, I said, European and Western societies, it became a luxury to say like, I could marry for love, where that wasn't always an option beforehand. Um, so this is like an example of how monogamy can be considered like a form of privilege and um, like definitely a first world luxury. Um, and it kind of just adds in to um, the disparity between first and third world countries and the idea that like we're superior to them because we look down on polyamory or, um, or polygamy as like um, an immoral form of relationships, mostly because of certain, uh, um, well, uh, certain practices, like because of religious extremism, um, where it isn't con uh, consensual or moral practices, and I, uh, I do like definitely point out that those are not like what I'm talking about here. This is like only focusing on consensual monogamy, which wouldn't include like forced relationships or situations where women are um, expected to marry into a family of polygamists. If that makes sense. Um, so, but like we can see just like looking at the history of um, hominids and like even today in the world that uh, non-monogamy is completely natural and it's a reoccurring phenomenon in humans as well as most, uh, as well as most animals. 
Um, and it's, so it's both logical and practical. Um, the differences that I'm suggesting we should employ in our own society are ones that would change practices and not allow to be more ethical, um, primarily by emphasizing explicit consent, um, and like that is potentially absent in other practices around the world today. So, um, so this is just like defining non-monogamy a little bit more to show you like the different ways that it can be performed. It's very broad. Um, so non-monogamy is an umbrella term that um, covers multiple different types of non-monogamy. So polyamory would be multiple marriages. Polygamy is um, multiple wives. Polygyny is multiple husbands. Um, sorry, other way around. Polygyny is multiple wives. Polyandry is multiple husbands. <laughs> Um, it also includes open and casual relationships um, where you might have a um, closed off romantic relationship but you're open sexually or like just casual dating, nothing serious or exclusive at all. Polyfidelity would be if you only have like two or three primary partners and it's closed off to anyone outside of those, those few people within your circuit. Um, there's also swinging and group sex, um, hopefully you know what that is. <laughs> Um, and then triads would be like when three people are equally involved with each other. Um, and that's also like similar to a closed circuit where like everyone is involved with each other equally and there's no like hierarchical ranking between individuals. Um, so that, like this picture just shows like how it can be very complex, just like any other dichotomy in society. It, it like there's way more, um, like there's more stuff going on than, than people think there really is. Um, so, um, so when we're explaining non monogamy, we have to understand that there's a difference between love and sex. Um, there is like romantic orientation and then there's sexual orientation. For example, some people might uh, be sexually attracted to both men and women, but only be romantically interested in men. Um, and, and then like your practices are also different too. You could be like bisexual, but you're not acting on it, so then you would be um, like you wouldn't be sexually active at all. So practices and your orientation are different as well. And there's several different types of love. Obviously, we understand that there's romantic love, which is what we're primarily talking about today. There's familial, familial love, your love for your family members, your parents, your siblings, um, your children. There's platonic love between friendships and um, people in your own community. And then there's also deistic love. Um, and so, like this, the similarities we see in all of these are that they're like modernly constructed. Um, I'm sorry, that like uh, they can all be biologically explained, um, except for romantic love. Romantic love is like a social construct. There's not really like a reason um, biologically that we can define for why you would feel the need for romanticism in your life, other than the purposes of reproduction. Um, but all the other ones are also plural. Um, you can love multiple family members, you can love multiple friends, you can love multiple deities. Um, and these are like common in all societies around the world. It doesn't like um, change that much like from culture to culture. Like you don't discriminate against your uh, sister just because you love your brother. You don't like only love one parent. Um, it doesn't, if you have like multiple friends, it doesn't mean that you're not committed to any of them. You still love all of them. You just love them differently and like oftentimes equally. <clears throat> So there's like a lot of reasons for why someone would choose to be consensually non-monogamous. Um, primarily, the, the big one is rejecting the idea of the one um, in society. It's often pressured upon uh, specifically like young girls from a, from a very young age. We see it all the time in Disney, in other media platforms, that this idea that there's like one perfect partner out there, like your other half or your soulmate. Um, and so non-monogamy rejects that concept that there's not just one person on this planet that could possibly make you happy, there's probably multiple. Um, and it doesn't, it's not limited to just romanticism, like you can find uh, love and belonging in other ways as well. Um, it's also understanding that like one person cannot fulfill all your emotional or physical needs and expecting them to do so is pretty unfair. Um, it puts a lot of pressure onto an individual uh, to be this perfect person for you. And that's like, no, no one is ever going to be able to do that. There's not a single person on this planet that's, that's perfect. Um, so this is like the issue with settling versus benevolence in relationships. 
Um, most people, especially in more conservative areas like Utah, we see people either um, put their partner up on a pedestal and expect them to be perfect, and then they're disappointed when they find out that they are not perfect. Or they go into a relationship knowing from the beginning that they're going to settle, they're going to give up things that they want, and um, but their partner can't provide, so they're going to compromise because they won't be able to find one partner who gives them everything that they're looking for. Um, so, uh, and then there's also like issues of bodily and emotional autonomy um, within feminist critiques, uh, suggesting that monogamous relationships, especially when they're pressured by society, is um, a, like fairly sexist. It's usually placed more on the women than it is on the male roles in relationships. Um, eliminating them sexually, saying what they can or cannot do with their body, and expecting them to be completely um, committed to one person, and shaming them when they're not. Uh, so this is like going into the rejection of sexist in institutions, uh, such as like the traditional view of marriage, that it, like it's ownership, that women are property um, via that traditional marriage that we discussed. So this is like the... Um, like one side of feminist arguments. There also is like a feminist argument on the other side saying that polyamory polygamy is anti-feminist because it, it also um, uh, objectifies women. Primarily this is again in societies where it's not actually consensual, um, such as in like Middle Eastern countries where it's uh, pressured upon women at a very young age. Um, and so like, unfortunately because of that, people think that, that means like non monogamy is always bad, and so they just like reject it completely. Um, but we can, if we're willing to like open up the dialogue, we can like discuss the fact that in a in a healthy consensual relationship, it can actually be like healthy and um, very satisfying for all those involved if it's completely open in communication. So there's. Um, there's a lot of like ethical application that goes behind this as far as like um, philosophical theory. Mostly it has to do with like existentialism, which is um, primarily from Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, um, and focusing on women having, um, being empowered sexually. That's what uh, her research, uh, her writings, her philosophical writings mostly focused on. Um, and also has a little bit to do with like love ethics, and as I mentioned earlier, Aristotelian theory. Um, that uh, there's uh, that there's only like there's a perfect love that like, it's two people one body uh, two bodies one soul and um, there's also the idea of like the perfect means that there's extremes in society and both are are bad and so we should look for a perfect means was Aristotle's thought so it could be argued that monogamy is an extreme um, but also that like certain forms of polyamory would be an extreme as well so how can we find a perfect means that's consensual and, and is balanced between those two. Um, a lot of my research was primarily by um, reaching out to Dr. Carrie Jenkins. She's a philosophy uh, professor in Canada that does, um, she's done all of her research on the metaph metaphysics of love. And um, she talks about like the dual nature theory of love, <clears throat> um, the idea that there's uh, Two, two parts to love that, um, well, that it, um, it can change over time and um, like we can address the ways that it's broken and in need of change um, and that it's both neurochemical and it's a social construct. So that's her, that's her theory. Um, and also she also talks about the romantic, <clears throat> the romantic mystique. Um, and it serves the interests of those who benefit the most from the way romantic love is uh, here and now in society. But by understanding and resisting the, um, its operations, we can empower ourselves to create something better in society. There, uh, so there are some social criticisms that are commonly heard. Um, mostly it's like the, it's only about sex that people who are non-monogamous are incapable of committing to someone, um, that they're sexually promiscuous, and it, uh, this is also very sexist because it has to do with like slut versus stud mentality. That if a man sleeps around, it's perfectly acceptable, and he's like, yeah, that's awesome, you're a man. But if a girl does it, then it's awful, and she's disgusting, and no one would want to, to be with her. Um, 
And this is like just not true of people in polyamorous relationships. Um, in fact, it's argued that it's like the complete like it's it doesn't even have to do with sex if it's it, depending on your version of polyamory. Um, and it's also commonly misconstrued to be like a, a lack of emotional security that it's a problem. But like there's something wrong with someone if they can't commit to one person that they just want attention, that they have anxiety, that there must be something wrong with them. Um, and this is also very damaging uh, to suggest that the only way that someone could possibly be emotionally secure is if they want to be married um, to one partner for the rest of their life. <clears throat> There's the argument that you're unable to commit to one person and that you have intimacy issues. Um, and this is also like the complete opposite. You can't fix a relationship by being polyamorous. In fact, you need to, you would have to be in a very comfortable, like completely open, communicative relationship to make a polyamorous um, relationship work. Because you have to completely trust your other partner, be really solid in that connection that you already have, before you could possibly consider opening it up to other people, whether it's sexually or romantically. Um, there's obviously common concerns with jealousy in society. And this is the same basic thing. Like Jealousy usually comes from a lack of communication or not knowing where someone stands, being unsure of something. If there's complete open communication between every party involved, there wouldn't be a reason to be jealous, um, as long as you're consent consenting to everything and talking through it. Um, and like you can see through all of these that like the recurring theme is that it's mostly sexist towards women, and those are like the women are always the ones that are criticized in these relationships. So. Um, there's also issues with oppression and um, safety within non-monogamous relationships and people. Um, there is such a thing as monogamous privilege. Um, it's similar to any other form of privilege, whether it's white privilege or, or gender privilege or anything else. Um, mostly it has to do with social and legal issues. Right now there's no legal um, safety, like there's no laws put in place to protect non-monogamous individuals from discrimination at this time in society. Um, so oftentimes they're the targets of discrimination in education, in their vocations, um, in certain social rights situations, um, and they're also oftentimes the targets of sexual violence, um, particularly women um, or, or non-binary people within non-monogamous relationships. Um, it's the whole idea that if you're non-monogamous, you can't actually be raped because you always want it, um, which is very harmful to all those involved. Um, so, yeah, there, there's, um, there's also issues within the polyamorous community itself, though, with, uh, mostly with misrepresentation. Um, the most visible people oftentimes are white, straight men. Um, those are the only ones we tend to see in, in the media, which is problematic, um, because as you, a lot of you probably know, um, Oftentimes, the media tends to broadcast the most extreme versions of any social movement or social group, and that's not like an accurate representation of people um, that fit into that category. So we there's definitely a lack of representation and intersectionality, specifically with like queer folk, people of color, um, less common non-monogamous practices, um, interracial relationships. Um, it, it, the list can go on and on, but um, it, it is like definitely something that we need to be addressing within the polyamorous community. And um, there, I, I also often hear people claim that polyamory is a sexual orientation, so it's something that they can't choose. It's similar to being gay or being lesbian. Um, this is somewhat problematic because it, it does run the risk of encroaching on safe spaces for queer individuals who legitimately are like discriminating in, in more overt ways in society today. Um, being a queer person of color is obviously going to garner more discrimination than being a white woman who happens to have two boyfriends. So that's definitely something that needs to be addressed and um, should be careful about encroaching on safe spaces for LGBTQ individuals, survivors of sexual assault, etc. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, by fostering like discussion about ethical non-monogamy, we can allow for growth and understanding 
in the non-monogamous community, and it also, by default, encourages mediation between intersectional communities and other marginalized groups. Um, this conversation surrounding polyamorous love is continuously growing, and it's going to uh, continue to, to grow and demand a place at the table, um, philosophical table, social justice table, in the study of ethics as we continue to strive for inclusivity and diversity and understanding, talking about these issues. Um, with individuals in situations like this. So um, I think I hit most of my main points, but I would love to open it up for questions and clarities. I'm sure I wasn't the best at defining things, so if you have any questions, please ask. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Non-monogamy is not something that's new in the world, of course. Mm -hmm. It's just the ethical part of it. Uh, with Google search showed me that cheating is, quote, cheating, which is having a sexual relationship of some sort outside of a monogamous relationship, is common in the U.S. About 30 to 60 percent is the estimate. So the difference is in ethical non monogamy. You don't cheat, you have a conversation and agreement about what. The relationship can be or may be. Uh, so the conversation, which is very difficult in a culture that doesn't talk about sex at all. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges in coming into ethical non-monogamy is being able to even have discussions about sex. Oh, exactly. Uh, you didn't reference uh, sex at dawn, but which is kind of a good base that it leads into this in our common culture. Uh, although it is easy to, and it's not easy, but even if couples have an opportunity to discuss the concept of non-monogamy with each other, uh, there is a biological component to emotional attachment. And what I've read is it is very difficult to continue relationships, even if they had a primary relationship orbiting outside of that for non-monogamy. It's difficult to hold that primary relationship over time. Um, like your, your primary partner versus secondary partners? Yes. Um, yeah, there. The research actually shows like the opposite for the most part. Like primary partners, the partnerships tend to be the ones that last, but secondary partners are the ones that jump usually. Um, the so the research does show that like between monogamous individuals and polyamorous individuals, the um, satisfaction as far as sex is pretty equal. However, um, research studies like have very strongly shown that polyamorous or non-monogamous individuals have higher levels of communication and satisfaction. Um, with conversations um, and uh, what else was it? Um, yeah, they have higher levels of satisfaction, commitment, trust, and communication in non-monogamous situations is what like research has shown. Does that does that same research extend to the period of time those relationships last? Because I'm seeing a period of about five years when they're in that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, the research that I've used primarily um, has been within like a couple of years. Um, something I want to do in the future is, is conduct like longer term research, of course. Um, but you bring up a good question, and that also has to do with like different forms of non-monogamy. And I personally think that there are certain issues with different forms of, of polyamory. Um, like hierarchical polyamory can get problematic because of what you're suggesting, like having a primary and having secondaries that are sexually and romantically involved can get a little hairy and um, is a little bit philosophically problematic when you consider the fact that like everyone wants a primary partner. Um, and so having like having hierarchy within your relationships causes structural problems. Um, so Preferably, I would suggest that if uh, people who are going to engage in romantic polyamory should be encouraged to try and make um, their partners equal. Or um, the the other suggestion would be um, not uh, having like 
romantic exclusivity, but sexually polyamorous, if that makes sense. Um, and then like that avoids the hierarchical uh, issues within that. I have a question. Has there ever been any research done on, on the dissolution of those relationships if those were based on the actual relationship dissolving or on the societal pressures put upon the relationship by being, or people in that relationship by being in that relationship, but over time, family members, friends, society, work members not approving of that situation can somehow deteriorate their relationship more quickly than it would in other ways. Right. No, and that's actually part of the problem. There's uh, very limited research right now. Um, the research that has been conducted is quantitative, not qualitative, and what you're describing is would have to be more qualitative, um, which is often, with such a difficult topic as it is already, um, within research fields, um, qualitative research is not it's looked down upon in comparison to quantitative research. So if you're already doing a topic that is difficult and then you want to do a qualitative research study, oftentimes you'll be rejected. Um, and also if you don't have any other research to like start with, if that makes sense, then, then they're like, where, where you don't even have a starting, a starting point. So um, the research that is available is, like I said, limited um, and it's within a certain time frame and it's not looking at all of the different issues that come into play, which would be a much more comprehensive and long study that should be done. But yeah, there's not really any research like that right now, unfortunately. Do we have any examples of, in modern day, of any polyandrous relationships actually working in the long run? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, well, so Dr. Gary Jenkins is um, essentially my mentor. I um, have discuss this with her a lot and I go to her for all of my research um, up to this point. And she's currently in a, in a successful relationship with um, two men. She's been married to her husband for 10 years and she's been with her boyfriend for two and a half. Um, I also personally know several people that have made it work um, when they're like, if you're referring to romantic polyamory, um, yeah, so I, I know plenty of people that have made it work over the long term. Well, we could all, all probably know of individual situations, but is there, any group, like say, I'm thinking of uh, the word commune, which in the past was largely based on a polyamorous thinking. I can't think of any commune that actually worked in the long run for their society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Sure, we can pick out individual situations, but is there any yeah, group that, that's associated with other constructs that go with that? There are, there are in every state in the United States, there are active polyamorous groups, communities, people who get together. You're in a Western society, and so the the vocabulary or the foundation in order to have normal conversation is difficult because it's all looked down upon. The mass movement with the LGBT, uh, I'm saying it wrong, with that community and bringing it more to a normal conversation. They started to present some foundation where these conversations can occur, right? But you ask the question, well, are there groups, are there people that succeed in this lifestyle? Well, it's secretive, not because of intent or malicious or anything like that, just because the society frowns on it so much, right? So you're not going to see a lot of that. But in, in every every state, everywhere within the United States, there's large groups are socially active and that. But because of the society pressure, it's not something where you wave a flag and say, hey, we're over here, kind of thing, you know. Uh, I, would, I, I would also point out that we're still tending to, when we're discussing that right there, we're still focusing mostly on Western cultures, which is, again, part of the problem, um, that we focus primarily on Western first world uh, situations and examples, rather than like looking at the full picture. And Eastern societies are very different than Western societies. Arranged marriages are much more successful than romantic-based relationships that we have here in, in the Western um, societies. Well, but now we're talking about having a successful marriage. If, uh, if a woman is told by her parents at age 10 or whatever that she has to marry this guy, and they never get divorced, does that make it a successful marriage? No, no, no. Oh, we're, like, we're, we're talking like consensual relationships where like um, the, the woman was of age, but it was an arranged marriage. Um, like That's pretty common in Indian culture, for example. I've personally known several people who were in um, arranged marriages and were very happy, like, and they hadn't even like 
gotten married. Like I went to high school with a couple of people from India who were in arranged situations and were looking forward to it. Those marriages tend to be more successful than um, romantic marriages. It's, it's set up from the time that they're young. Their parents are very involved with the other family um, and they, like, they know who's compatible and how it's going to work because love, we, in Western societies, we put this huge emphasis on love, sex, um, attraction, all these things that don't last. Um, instead of like primarily focusing on commonalities, if, how do you want to raise your children? Do you have common religiosity? Do you have common values? Those are the things that make a successful relationship. And in arranged marriages in Eastern cultures, that's what they value. They don't value as much as we do, like that love aspect and the sex aspect. Yeah, I wanted to argue that uh, I lived in Japan for a long time and periodically there'd be articles about uh, how arranged marriages would still happen in Japan. Uh, and again, and they are definitely not forced anymore. It's, it's illegal, but um, did they have uh, a lower divorce rate than so-called love marriages? Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I I still I'm all for society becoming more accepting of different lifestyles and different choices for how to live your life. But um, you talked earlier about the primary relationships lasting, the secondary ones not. Um, so it, it seems to me like it just, and maybe it's because of our, our uh, the legal situation and the legal institutions in this country. But you know, if a couple, if a married couple decides to expand their relationship to bring either another man or another woman or more than one, if things go wrong, it's going to be the single person that you know is out. And uh, you know, how do they make a long term? commitment that doesn't risk their, them financially and legally and, and emotionally in a way that the married couple would not be risked. Because they can experiment and have some fun and even love other people. But it, it seems to me that you, by definition, they're on unequal footing. And I don't know how. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I'm, I'm hoping that people can be successful at new forms of relationships. But I just have a lot of. Uh, no, and I totally understand that. Um, and I, I wanted to like present all of the different types of non-monogamy to be fair to them. I personally have my own views on what like I prefer or what I think works best. Um, so I would tend to agree that like oftentimes uh, such a, like hierarchical poly, which was what you were describing, like when there's primaries and secondaries. Like if you're already married and you have like a few kids and then you and then you have like a secondary partner, those are more likely to not last and that's because you already have like a family bond with your primary partner um and you've been like you've been established with them for a while so it makes sense that that would like not last um what like i personally think works the best is uh romantic monogamy but like sexual polyamory or sexual openness um mostly because like that we have a 60 percent uh, divorce rate in America, and like uh, someone else said, like 30 to 40 percent of people have like, cheated on their on their spouse. It's very common. And if you're cheating on your spouse, then you're not monogamous. Like you're like the you know if you're cheating, then you're not monogamous. It's pretty straightforward. So if we're the only reason that we're pressuring ourselves into these monogamous relationships is because we're expected to do that by like cultural expectations. But obviously, if people are going out looking for other sexual partners, then that's like what they're inclined towards it's not what and even like uh, biologically historically hominids aren't usually sexually monogamous creatures uh, it's pretty common for uh, human beings and, and gorillas and, and other hominids to have multiple sexual partners throughout their life well it's usually serial monogamy yeah we have time for one more question do you have a question Jeff? like why is this going to add to two things if you remember both of them uh, one on the commune comparison that's a hard comparison. The, the course that Gene Marie just got back from, Jeff Lawson, I took his course as well, he made a comment. You know, there's been a form of permaculture, like older form of similar to permaculture, where they try to make a commune concept, and it just failed. And he said, I formed a gardening club with all the people around me that were doing permaculture. We didn't do a commune, we did a club, and I looked around at all these individuals and said, all, I never want to live in a commune with them, but I love them all, you know? And that's kind of why my communes often fail, that you just got from whoever, right? And those clashes of personality is not necessarily a great comparison of a yes. Yeah, well, and, and communes often, um, I'm assuming your examples are probably 
like more modern day versions or like within the last hundred years. And that like that makes more sense because we've progressed technologically um, and socially in the last two hundred years. Whereas like when we were hunter gatherers, communes, what we call a commune was their social interaction. Like that's kind of how they lived. And it worked because the like emphasis in society for humans at that time was survival. That's like all they were focused on was surviving and eating and having sex. <laughs> that was pretty much it. But we have like we've developed um, intellectually over the years, obviously, and so now we have other things that we care about in society. We want intellectual stimulation, we want like technology, we want um, medical innovation, and so like those communes don't work as much because there's more things that we need to be satisfied. And that's actually they've done research on that to show like over the, over several hundred years the amount of stuff that an individual needs to be happy has gone up like exponentially. So. One more question. So it's not really a question, but putting together a few things that you said with some thoughts, it sounds like this is a very much the whole idea of what's in it for me rather than what's in it for society, what works best for society. I love your beginning thoughts about we shouldn't be critical of what works in other countries. Obviously, that's quite true. But also, there was a statement uh, that there's not just one person on the earth that can make you happy, but nobody can make another person happy. And talk about that there's not one person that can meet all of your needs, but it's it's not just about my needs. A marriage is a is a group endeavor, and it and it has to do with children and families. It's not a thing in isolation. And you talked about that you couldn't just that that the research that counted was the quantitative, the, not the qualitative. And yet you also said that successful marriages, there are more successful marriages in arranged marriages. That's the word successful is a qualitative thing. So I'm just thinking there might be some other aspects that you might want to add to your paper. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, I, I haven't been able to, because I'm still in my undergraduate, so I haven't actually performed my own research yet. That's like something I'm doing in the next year, uh, is getting a research study approved so that I can actually do that. <laughs> but um, like, no, you, you have really good points. Um, and uh, I forgot what I was going to address that you said, actually. Um, I forget. You said something good, though. All right, <laughs> Unfortunately, for the sake of our kids, leaders, so that they don't go crazy, we have to keep to a hard time limit. We fully expect the conversation to continue. If you have more questions, I don't know if you have more time, yeah. Kelly. Um, you already addressed what kind of resources they can do. They can they find the, the, the books you suggest at the beginning, right? I want to see if there's any other resources, if anyone's curious and wants to investigate the subject more. Um, it, it depends on like, what type of reading they want to do. Like, There's plenty of um, books I can recommend as far as like just if you want to read on the philosophical side of um, non-monogamy, which is, this was an ethics paper, it was a philosophy paper that I originally wrote, but um, if someone's interested more in research, then I have the uh, peer-reviewed articles that I can send to people if they were interested. Okay. I also have a podcast I listen to, it's totally not on this subject, but two of the three hosts happen to be polyamorous, and so they did a podcast on it, if anyone wants, I can give you the name of that. And, and track down the episode, and that was pretty interesting. I never, ever even thought about the subject until then. It was eye opening. It was very, very much along the lines of what Kelly's presented. So let's give Kelly one more hand. And